at close to 99, I can tell you that. Cello! How would you like one across your lip? Norman Lear, whose comedies changed the face of TV, is dead at 101. And that has as much to do with my being here today as anything else. As the producer of All in the Family and many other shows, Mr. Lear showed that it was possible to be topical, funny, and immensely popular. Guys like us, we had it made. No. Norman Lear, the television writer and producer who introduced political and social commentary into situation comedy with All in the Family and other shows, proving that it was possible to be topical as well as funny while attracting millions of viewers, died on Tuesday at his home in Los Angeles. He was 101. It's made the country and the media uh, enormously aware. A spokeswoman for the family, Lara Berkthold, confirmed the death. I paid a dollar forty-nine for no caffeine. <laughs> I can pay the same. Mr. Lear reigned at the top of the television world through the 1970s and into the early 80s, leaving a lasting mark with shows that brought the sitcom into the real world. The Jeffersons looked at the struggles faced by an upwardly mobile black family. A very different black family on Good Times dealt with poverty and discrimination. Now I looked that up in the, in the paper this morning. You know what it's going for? 38 cents a pound. Well, why don't he? The protagonist of Maud was an outspoken feminist. The heroine of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, was plagued by all manner of modern day problems, not least her own neurosis. You looked around television in those years, Mr. Lear said in a 2012 New York Times interview, referring to the middle and late 1960s. Uh, is uh, insidious. It isn't the American way. And the biggest problem any family faced was, mother dented the car and how do you keep dad from finding out? The boss is coming to dinner and the roast is ruined. The message that was sending out was that we didn't have any problems. Mr. Lear's show sent different messages, far more in tune with what was actually happening in those turbulent times. I had as good a time in this business as anybody has ever had in any business ever. His crowning achievement was All in the Family, and his greatest creation was Archie Bunker, the focus of that show and one of the most enduring characters in television history. When we introduced Americans to the Bunkers and the Jeffersons, people weren't used to it. An unapologetic bigot who was seemingly always angry at one minority group or another, and usually at least one family member as well. Archie, memorably portrayed by Carol O'Connor, was also with his malprops, his mangled syntax, and his misguided enthusiasm, strangely likable. A sitcom shockwave. All in the Family sent a shock through the sleepy world of the sitcom with one tart, topical episode after another from the moment it premiered on CBS on January 12, 1971. Even now, more than 50 years later, there are critics who say that this date should live in infamy, that ABC was right when it turned down the show out of fear that it would offend too many people. Archie, in this view, was a fanatic who made narrow-mindedness seem appealing. But Mr. Lear, who adapted All in the Family from a British sitcom and based Archie in part on his own father, saw it differently. I've never known a bigot who didn't have something endearing, he once said. Mr. Lear went on to create a television empire and to become politically active, notably with his founding of the liberal advocacy organization, People for the American Way, the kind of organization that Archie Bunker would have enjoyed sneering at. Archie had choice words for all races, creeds, and sexual orientations, except his own, and he didn't spare his family. His sweet and dignified wife, Edith, was a dingbat. His daughter, Gloria, was a weeping Nelly. His liberal son-in-law, Michael Stivick, was a meathead and on occasion, a dumb Pollock. Strictly a law and order guy, Archie also voiced strong reservations about what he saw as campus subversives, welfare chiselers, and bleeding hearts. Such pronouncements were scandalous in the prime time television world of the day, but Mr. Lear had found a gold mine. All in the Family ran until 1979 and dominated the ratings for more of that time. More important, it established a template for television comedy by mixing political and social messages as well as moments of serious drama with the laughter. The Lear philosophy was further developed into two shows built around characters who originally appeared on All the Family, Maud and the Jeffersons. 
Maud, which ran from 1972 to 1978 on CBS, centered on Edith Bunker's cousin, Maud Findlay, who was as much a doctrinaire liberal as Archie was a determined denizen of the far, far right. The show dealt with alcoholism, pot smoking, abortion, Maud herself had one in a two-part episode that generated outrage as well as applause and other subjects to which that quick tongue title character could apply her shrill wisdom. George Jefferson, the central character of the Jeffersons, was a black man who ran a successful dry cleaning business in Archie's neighborhood and whose disdain for white people rivaled Archie's for black people. The Jeffersons, the story of George's life with his newly moneyed family after they moved to the east side of Manhattan, ran on CBS from 1975 to 1985. Not all of Mr. Lear's shows grew out of Archie's universe. One that did not, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, raised as many eyebrows as all in the family. A five episodes a week spoof of soap operas, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman was the story of a television obsessed housewife, Louise Lasser in the title role, in the fictional small town of Fernwood, Ohio, who had more than her share of calamity. Her grandfather was a flasher, her mother was a flake, her husband was cheating on her, their daughter was kidnapped, and Mary herself had a breakdown on live TV. Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman was too hot for the networks. Mr. Lear syndicated it himself, and in most markets, it was on after the late news. He said he thought of the show as affirmative and its characters as survivors, but for all the waves they made, they did not survive long. The show made its debut in 1976. Miss Lasser left the next year and after being replaced for the summer by the talk show parody Fernwood Tonight, which later morphed into America Tonight, and then returning without her as Forever Fernwood, it was gone by early 1978. Other Lear shows had longer lives. Sanford and Son, starring the longtime black comedian Red Fox as an irascible junk dealer, and like All in the Family, based on a successful British sitcom, ran on NBC from 1972 to 1977. One Day at a Time, CBS 1975 to 84, concerned a divorced woman living on her own with two teenage daughters. Good Times, CBS 1974 to 79, a spin-off of Maud, was the story of a hard-working black woman struggling to raise a family in a Chicago housing project, at first with her husband, and then when Mr. Amos was let go as a widow, son of a salesman. Norman Milton Lear was born on July 27, 1922 in New Haven, Connecticut to Herman and Jeanette Lear. His father was a salesman of various products who was not very good at selling much of anything, who sometimes ran afoul of the law, and who had, his son later recalled, more than a hint of Archie in him. He would tell his wife to stifle herself, just as Archie would with Edith, and more than once told Norman, you're the laziest white kid I ever saw. Raised mostly in Hartford, Norman graduated from Weaver High School there in 1940 and attended Emerson College in Boston but left shortly after the United States entered World War II to enlist in the Army Air Forces. He rose to technical sergeant and flew 52 missions as a radioman, most from a base near Foggia, Italy. He received the Air Medal with four oak leaf clusters. After the war, millions of servicemen and women took advantage of the GI Bill of Rights to attend college, but Mr. Lear decided he would not return to Emerson. With the help of an uncle who was a press agent, he got a job with the publicity firm of George and Dorothy Ross who had many clients in the theater. He lasted a year before being fired for planting one too many items that were demonstrably false. He found a new way to put his imagination to better use after he and his first wife, Charlotte, moved to Los Angeles in 1949. For a while, he and a friend, Ed Simmons, worked as door-to-door -door salesmen. Eventually, they started to write comedy routines together. The break came when Mr. Lear called the agent for the popular nightclub entertainer Danny Thomas, who would later become a TV star, and got his home phone number by pretending to be a New York Times reporter. Mr. Thomas appreciated the boldness of the ploy. He also liked the routine the two men wrote for him and purchased it. Norman Lear, TV legend, last words before he died. I think people believe in heaven because they don't like the idea of dying. I've noticed that even those who assert that everything is predestined and that we can change nothing about it still look both ways before they cross the street.